in a normal sunny day outside will produce 25,000 units of vitamin D a day. Now compare that to the current UK government uh, a recommended amount of uh, 400 units per day. It makes it look really quite laughable. Uh, here's the original paper here. Now you can get most of this paper. Um, you can download quite a lot of this paper and it's so interesting. Um, it gives quite a lot of the historical background if you read the introduction. What happened back in the 1920s and 30s when people started realising the importance of vitamin D for things like treating tuberculosis and psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, they actually gave doses that were way too high, like 10 times too high. And that's why people became paranoid about the higher doses of vitamin D. So we went down to like minuscule doses. Uh, daily oral dosing of vitamin D3 to 5,000 to 50,000 units a day hospitalized patients and now these were patients admitted to a, um, a psychiatric facility often for severe uh, men mental illness but it meant they were able to monitor all the vitamin d levels of the patients that came in offer supplements and titrate it up so it's a really really good sample actually i think it's a very nice piece of research they say vitamin d is a hormone produced in the skin which is true it is uh, in amounts estimated up to twenty-five thousand international units a day so if we were like uh, hunter-gatherers or living outside like we're supposed to or agricultural labourers or if I'm spending all day at summer in my allotment, then I should be making about 25,000 units a day. Much higher than a lot of people think. That is a really quite a large amount of vitamin D that's been made in this natural physiological situation, which is probably a pretty good comparator to take. Uh, the actions of ultraviolet B uh, radiation, as we know, on the skin. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is common, the authors say, and we know that's true. Lack of uh, exposure to the sun, present in very few food sources. No, it's not surprising. Deficiency is strongly linked to an increase in a multitude of diseases, the authors correctly say. And we've looked at some on this uh, on this channel before. I haven't prepared this, so I'll see what I can remember. Immunity, of course. Heart disease. Multiple sclerosis. Autoimmune disease. Colon cancer, for sure. Um, low levels of vitamin D are highly correlated with colon cancer and probably prostate cancer and breast cancer as well. We could go on. If, several of which have been historically shown to dramatically improve with ultraviolet exposure to the skin. Like in the old days, they used to put the TB patients out on the balcony. Or supplements can also be effective. Uh, these diseases included, now this is the examples that they give here, asthma, psoriasis, the inflammation of the skin, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, I've looked after patients in absolute agony for years with rheumatoid arthritis. And the idea that I could have helped these patients pain by giving them high doses of vitamin D, and I didn't, because we didn't know about it. But, but why didn't we know about it? You know, this is not prehistory I'm talking about. Um, it just seems such a pity that these patients weren't helped with this very, very safe, very, very cheap and efficacious intervention and we've looked at research that shows that people that are low in vitamin d do get more viral respiratory viral infections or influenza anyway that's been clearly demonstrated offered supplement to correct deficiency 4700 emissions and most of them agreed to it and of course we also know that vitamin d deficiency predisposes towards depression seasonal affective disorder so uh, psychiatric patients as all patients as in all people can benefit from from this so it's good to see that that was uh, that was done vast majority agreed to supplementation typically patients had uh, 5,000 to 10,000 units a day that's 125 micrograms to 250 micrograms and remember the UK government guideline I think is is it 400 a day now it's, it just makes it look completely laughable uh, and now some patients due to disease concerns were given 20,000 to 50,000 units a day that's uh, 500 micrograms to 1.25 uh, 1 milligrams, 1250 micrograms. So really quite high daily doses um, to try and treat particular uh, diseases such as psoriasis and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I think. Uh, no cases of vitamin D induced hypercalcemia. Hyperhigh calcium in the blood. That's what people worry about. They had no cases. I think this is important to emphasize some most patients are on five to ten thousand a day some patients are on 20 to fifty thousand a day no complications at all none no complications at all reported 
in any of the patients. A marked clinical improvement, uh, three patients with psoriasis who had the higher dose, marked clinical improvement, no adverse reactions. Now, analysis of 1400, uh, 418 inpatients that they looked at recently, they were there long enough to develop blood levels of 74.4 nanograms a mil, so reasonably high, it showed a mean uh, vitamin D concentration level of 118.9 nanograms per mil. This would normally be considered high, but as we say, no adverse reactions. And the range in these patients was 74 to, 800, uh, 30 to 384. Now, here's the key thing. In these patients who had such high levels of uh, vitamin D, the blood calcium, the mean was uh, 9.6 milligrams per deciliter. And the range is uh, that the range went from 8.6 to 10.7. And the normal range is normally 8.5 to 10.5. So this is quite acceptable. Now, you do see variations in range a bit. Uh, I, I take my normal ranges from um, Davidson's Principle and Practice of Medicine. So um, I think we can be fairly sure that is the accurate normal range. So basically, we can say this is essentially within, within range, certainly not high enough to cause any problems. Now, they also took a comparator group over the years of people that didn't take vitamin D. Uh, they had an average level of a uh, mean level of 27.1. So way, way lower. Remember, the average uh, vitamin D levels in the people uh, taking vitamin D were um, 118.9. So that was the people taking vitamin D, 118. Uh, the people not taking vitamin D, it was uh, 27.1. So way, way lower. Now, what about their calcium? Well, it was 9.5. So the people on these huge doses of vitamin D, their calcium was 9.6. Average, mean, which is okay. Uh, people not taking vitamin D, 9.5. So we can see basically it's the same. There's no statistical difference between them. Is a hormone that's released in response to low calcium levels. The D3 users, it was uh, 24.2. The non-D3 users was 30.2, indicating that the non-D3 users were actually um, releasing some uh, some parathyroid hormone, parathormin, to try and keep their calcium levels up, which I thought was interesting. Now, in summary, the, the, authors, uh, the authors said this in summary, long-term supplementation with vitamin D3 in doses ranging from 5 to 50,000 units a day appears to be safe. Conclusion. Daily oral intake of vitamin D3 ranging from 5,000 up to 60,000 in few cases for several years, for several years, was well tolerated in say and safe in both our patients and staff. So the staff got to realise this was a good thing going on here. And they, the mean vitamin D level blood levels in our patients appears to be taken, taken around 12 months to plateau. So they were giving patients five to 10,000 units a day. And it was still taking... The vitamin D levels went up for a whole year before they plateaued. Now, that to me indicates that the vitamin D levels were so slow, it took a year to get up to the levels that the body wanted it to, to be at. So 5,000 to 10,000 units a day for a year before the levels plateaued out. And how did they plateau out? Um, the average vitamin D concentration in the blood, patients taking 10,000 units of vitamin D a day at 12 months, uh, the vitamin D was up to 96 nanograms a mil. But then they carried on for another, uh, another what, four months and uh, basically uh, the, the plateaued. So it's 16 months up to 97 nanograms per mil. Again, all with no adverse reactions reported at all. Currently considered upper limit is 100 nanograms a mil. No question at all in my mind that authorities around the world, health authorities, should increase the recommended amount of vitamin D. The current recommended amounts, in my view, are way too low. Now, of course, I can't tell you what to take. You have to see your own doctor. It should ideally be titrated according to your blood levels. Currently, I'm taking 8,000 units per day with 200 micrograms of vitamin K2. That's what I'm taking. Can't tell you what to take. You've got to see your own doctor for that. I am not your doctor. The research was performed without external funding. Oh, when are we going to start using inexpensive preparations where there's evidence of efficacy? Why aren't governments around the world changing their recommendations based on evidence like this and, and, and much more evidence that we could have cited? It's obvious why. 
corporate interests aren't advocating because they can't make any money out of it. But I don't care. I want to improve my health and your health.